Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome to this session. We will talk on mental workload and performance, how mental workload affects performance. Just to recapitulate what we have done in the previous sessions, uh, we talked about multitasking, which involves performing two tasks simultaneously, or switch between tasks, or perform those tasks sequentially, one after the other. Then resource allocation depends on the level of the task difficulty. So if both the tasks are resource demanding, then performance can decline on both the tasks or one of the tasks, depending upon which task is given more priority. So performance resource function represents the relationship between the resource demand and task performance. If a task is primary, that is of priority, then it will be allocated more resources. Psychological theories describe the mechanism underlying task performance and working memory, uh, basically the executive control, allocates cognitive resources to the tasks. So we have talked about these points. And just to continue with where we left in the previous session, uh, we had talked about the resources and its classification into those resources the, which are on the side of receiving information and processing that information. So basically perception and working memory, these two basic processes are involved. Then on the response side, response related resources which require response selection and response execution. Now the resources for these two categories that is reception of information in this processing and response selection and its execution. They use different resources and therefore there will be least interference or actually no interference between these two. So one can say that as far as resources are concerned, there's a multiplicity. There's in fact a dichotomy of stages of information processing. Then we talked about processing codes where dimensions of processing codes were talked about analog and spatial processing and categorical and symbolic processing. And we made a distinction between spatial and verbal codes which use different resources. So interference will not be there between the verbal and the spatial codes. And then responses can be manual and verbal, both or one of them. And manual response, for example, mouse movement on the computer when we do some work and verbal, verbal responses utterances, for example, verbal utterances. Uh, the processes uh, can be time shared uh, more efficiently between these because these are independent of each other. They use different resources. <clears throat> then we talked about perceptual modalities, cross-model time sharing, for example, between eye and ear. So these are vision and hearing are two different modalities. Therefore, time sharing is much better than time sharing between the channels which use the same uh, mode, for example, auditory or visual. So for example, AA, auditory, auditory channel, both two information or two different pieces of information, both coming to the auditory channel are uh, more likely to interfere. Then training on attention allocation strategies, for example, redundant displays in two channels, visual and verbal, can foster the best of both. So uh, the point is that we talked about redundancy. That means basically we present the same information in two different channels. And therefore, if both auditory and verbal modalities present the same information in an audiovisual presentation, for example, then the, because of the redundancy, the effect of interference can be also further reduced. Now, all this 
information can be combined into a three dimensional structure of multiple resource model, where <coughs> we have say on the horizontal axis we have these stages from perception to response selection and execution and there is cognition in between where working memory decision making and other processes come in. And then on the depth uh, we have the verbal versus spatial code. So, access can be verbal or spatial. So, this is the depth part and <coughs> then on the uh, vertical axis uh, we have uh, the, the, the visual and auditory modalities and within visual there can be ambient energy or focal energy that is the energy that is because of the particular information display for example and that is of focus. And then this division indicates that the resources between these stages are non-interfering. So, uh, in fact, the, uh, as we talked about the stage 1 in terms of information reception and processing and stage 2 in terms of action selection and response execution. The, they will use uh, different resources, so interference will not be there. So, this three dimensional model represents how these different resources are divided or available without any interference between uh, those stages. Now, how does allocation of resources go? How does the executive control come into picture? Executive control as we remember is a component of the working memory. So, basically there is an ongoing task. So, what we are assuming that in a continuous task situation, uh, normally that is what will happen. For example, uh, say a tracking task or on an the, the in the uh, audio uh, verbal speech for example. These are all ongoing tasks and there is a ongoing task means there is nothing only one task is being done. For example, on the ATR the air traffic control tower the radar operator is just operating on some ongoing task and in between there may be some interruption and that may be rare, that may be more frequent etcetera, etcetera. So, when there is an ongoing task, then <coughs> the attention is paid to that particular task. All resources are allocated to that particular task. And then there is an interruption task announcement that may be made. And this announcement uh, generally for example, uh, in, uh, in vigilance situations the announcement may not be there. But for other situations, the announcements uh, may be there in any form. For example, the, uh, we talked about the example of the receptionist who discusses with the visitors, response to the telephone call, response to the call by the boss and all that is happening and in between there may be some call to get some information to the boss. So, these are all announcements which are made and then that particular task can start. So, when the interrupting task starts, there is a time gap when it can take place and this time gap is called switch time. So, there is some amount of time lost when there is a switch between the tasks from the ongoing task to the interrupting task. And when the interrupting task is going on, then nothing else can be done and therefore, uh, after some time when the interrupting task is over again because an ongoing task goes on. <coughs> Therefore, again there is a switch time. So, S1 and S2 are the switch times and so interrupting tasks this a simple example there may be several interrupting tasks over a long period of ongoing tasks. Ongoing tasks can change several things happen. But this is just to understand how for example, between an ongoing task and an interrupting task, how they will be switching cost uh, as well as to the resource demands. So, OT that is the ongoing task is a more continuous higher priority task that is how we can define OT whereas, IT can be discrete or continuous. So, in between it will be present, 
it may be just uh, one switch of response saying yes or no, or it may be a continuous task, for example, searching for some information and then providing this information to whosoever has asked for that particular information. There's always a switch cost. Uh, that is increased RT or errors. So switch cost is in terms of the response time increases for the ongoing task or for the interrupting task or some errors may be committed. Then there's a clear statement of what operations are to be performed that if that is statement is available, then it can reduce the switch cost. So right in the beginning, if somebody knows that during the, this process, in between there will be some interruptions, what kind of interruptions, for how long, how much demanding those interruptions will be in terms of resources, then switch costs can be reduced because there will be some kind of preparation. And there's a decreased interval between switches. If we do that, then that again increases switch cost. So if too many interruptions, then switch cost will increase further. So what are the characteristics of ongoing tasks? First of all, engagement. They are engaging. Then engaging ongoing tasks uh, is also called cognitive tunneling. Cognitive tunneling means the per cognitive information or processing is tunneled, thus focusing on that particular piece of information, the process that is to be carried out. It inhibits the detection of interrupting task. So engagement means consciously you are involved in doing certain tasks and therefore it is possible that detection of the interrupting task uh, may be missed. <clears throat> then modality. An auditory ongoing task involving working memory is more resistant to interruption. So basic idea is that if there is a uh, uh, verbal message instruction that is being communicated and that uses working memory and then the interruption will be less. Dynamics. The performer of an ongoing task involving a dynamic control system, for example, driving a car, resists an interruption of the system as in a temporary unstable state. So basically, because the ongoing task is very important right now, and the dynamics is such that if an error is committed, that can lead to real consequences uh, negative consequences. Then priority of the ongoing task. Operators involved in a high priority operating task resist an interrupting task. So uh, they, they, they may put it off, cue them, or forget about them. Then some go, sub goal completion. Interrupting task delays switch one. If an ongoing task sub goal has just been completed. We have talked about refractory period, and you know because when ongoing task sub goal has just been completed, there is some consolidation time required, and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Then delay in S1 provides two opportunities. One is rehearsing the leaving of plane. So wherever the task is being stopped because of the interrupting task, then it can be rehearsed. Then physically placing some sort of bookmark. Because after the interrupting task is over, the operator will go back to the ongoing task. And that must be the point where it was left off. So finally, uh, the idea is that delay in S1, uh, this provides uh, opportunities for these two. So as far as multitasking is concerned, uh, the following learning outcomes uh, can be derived for further uh, topic, for example, uh, mental workload. So after this session on mental workload, you'll be able to define mental workload, describe task demands in terms of mental workload and its effect on task performance, describe four mental workload assessment techniques. We'll talk about these four techniques and how they can be used and how we uh, get to know about various you know, the level of workload and uh, what can be done about the workload. Then describe the basis to select an appropriate workload assessment technique. On what basis? If there are so many techniques, which technique will be appropriate in a given situation? So what are those criteria based on which we can select the best technique? 
and generally uh, one method or technique will, may not be sufficient. So, we may have to use a combination of different techniques. So, what is mental workload? Mental workload refers to the demand on cognitive resource capacity when performing a task. Cognitive capacity is limited. For example, in working memory, we talked about uh, the magic number 7 plus minus 2. What is the upper limit to the information that can be actively processed? The working memory is that. And uh, from there, we can derive that the amount of information that can be handled is logs 7 to the base 2, uh, a median range, and therefore about 2 to 3 bits of information is the upper limit of handling information in the working memory. And mental workload is also known as cognitive workload. So basically, uh, if we come across these two terms, we are basically meaning the same. But both of them are using cognitive resources, where cognitive process, each cognitive process uses some resources, cognitive resources. So how does deterioration in task performance occur? What happens? What is it? How the task performance related to the task demands or resource demands. Now, the task demand depends upon the characteristics of the task. A task may be complex or difficult. Uh, it may be, have to be, has to be performed with a greater or lesser speed. Uh, there may be presence of concurrent tasks. Uh, noise may be present. Noise can be distracting. Noise has uh, various impacts on performance. It can improve performance. For example, a very low volume music in many workplaces can be uh, revigorating and th that can energize people to work. And unsupportive environmental conditions, low temperatures, for example, or humidity, etc., or visibility, so ambient conditions may be uh, unfriendly. So, unfriendly environments and uh, also situations where uh, the ambient energy may be below the sub-threshold level, so we cannot see the information correctly or uh, it may be smudged. Then demand on cognitive, so this puts the demand on cognitive resources. So as the task demand increases, the demand for cognitive resources also increases. And that has an effect on task performance. If cognitive demand goes up, then task performance goes down. And particularly in the concurrent task situation, that will happen. The first priority normally would be to allocate highest level or maximum resources to the priority task and or primary task. And then only the uh, resources, if available, may be allocated to the secondary task. Now, the resource demand and resource supply, uh, these two are related. And these can be represented in their two-dimensional representation. And basically, <coughs> it is primary task resource demand, resources supplied, and performance. So there are three things here. One is we are looking at resource demand and resource supply, and how it affects performance on a single task or on multiple tasks. So let us see uh, what happens. So in this figure, we see that uh, on the horizontal axis, we have the resource demanded. And uh, we can say that uh, resource demand is increasing from left to right. And resource supply is on the vertical side. And that is also increasing from lower value to a higher value. So resource supply is increasing in that direction. And resource demanded increasing in that direction. So this continuous curve represents the supply of, so this is the resource supply. The continuous curve is for resource supply. Whereas the broken curve is for perf the workload and performance on the task. So basically, we can say that the vertical line is representing two regions. One is, or two different pieces of information. One is about the resources demanded, and other is about the performance or workload in the 
performance of the task. So what can be seen is that, to begin with, if the resource demand is less than the um, resources available or resource capacity, then uh, the performance will increase. But as the resource demand increases, as the resource demand increases, then uh, the and if it remains below the maximum resources that are available, that are possible. So this line indicates the maximum resources or co maximum cognitive resource. So if the cognitive resource demand is less than maximum, performance will remain almost constant. The workload will remain almost constant and this is the low workload region. So basically if the resources available are more than the resources demanded, then the workload will be low. However, as it reaches the maximum and if the demand for workload further increases, then the performance starts declining. And we enter into a high workload region. So the, there are two regions. Basically, we can say on the x-axis, when we are talking about resource demanded, then this can be divided into these two regions, the low workload region and the high workload region. And in the high workload region, the performance declines. It will not immediately go uh, to low level or almost no performance, but there is a decline and this is a, you know, one can say that decline at a certain uh, slope, at a certain speed. And if the demand becomes very high, then of course the performance will be very low. So on this, these two curves that the resource demand and resource supply, there is a knee. Knee means there is a turn, the, the curves take a turn, so either from horizontal it is becoming to some steep curve or from a curve it is becoming to a horizontal curve. So this knee is called the red line. So there is a red line means that on the two sides of the red line, we have the low workload region and the high workload region. And a distinction can be made between these two in terms of the this discontinuity, discontinuity between the two curves. So wherever this discontinuity is happening. So one of the uh, expectations or assumptions is that if there is a discontinuity on one of the curves, the demand, there will also be discontinuity on the other. So that is the uh, red line. And generally it should be considered as a red zone. Uh, so red zone means because you know this red line will not be fixed. It will depend upon not only upon the task but from situation to situation on the given task the location of the red line can change. And also it will depend upon the nature of the task, uh, when is the task performed and what are the conditions under which the task is performed, con whether there is another task and so on. Now this region is called the reserve capacity region. So there will be a reserve capacity available if the resource demand is less than the maximum available. So as first priority, the resources will be allocated to the primary task. And the reserve capacity can then be used for performing the secondary task. So this is how the reserve capacity concept can be used. So basic idea is that the overall performance uh, and overall mental workload will depend upon how much resource is available, how much cognitive resource is available and how much is, of it is being used. If the demand is less than the available or supply, then there will be uh, no workload or little workload, but if the demand exceeds the supply, then there will be workload. 
So, basically when we want to talk about the measurement of mental workload, this is the information that can be used basically in all uh, measurements of mental workload. So, one important question is can we predict when the demand will exceed supply and remedy the overload condition. So, if the demand exceeds supply we say there is an overload mental overload workload is higher than the capacity can handle. So, performance decrement due to multitasking for example, can be used. So, we can use a primary and a secondary task and we can use the multiple source model that we have just presented and however, it determines relative workload not absolute workload. So, we can find out relatively for example, <coughs> for which particular task the uh, workload is more and for which it is less, but we cannot say absolutely where we have a higher workload. So, to get some idea about absolute workload timeline analysis can be used. Now, what happens in timeline analysis is that over a period of time several time windows are identified and suppose there are multiple tasks. So, this is task A, three tasks, task A, B and C and <clears throat> these are some time windows. So, just to give an example we have sampled five time windows and then the tasks are being performed for a certain period of time, time is increasing in that direction. So, here task A is performed for lesser period than task B etcetera uh, and here task B is performed for a much larger duration compared to task A and C. So, and in different windows different tasks may be performed for different durations and different combinations of tasks may be performed uh, with different durations. Then the percentage of workload at each point so, here uh, we can have a <coughs> plot for example, <coughs> here we can have a plot where uh, you know a point is there, a point is there and a point is there some points. So, at each point uh, we compute the average or percentage of workload. percentage of workload in different time windows computed as the average number of tasks per unit time within each time window. So, within so this we know this time length or duration uh, we compute the average number of tasks within this time duration and then we take an average and we convert it into percentage and therefore, uh, those values will be available. So, here uh, two tasks for this duration etcetera and this how the based on the timeline analysis the percentage and as we know percentage measurements are absolute measurements. Uh, we made a distinction between nominal, ordinal and ratio levels of measurements. So, if we get percentages then we are talking about some absolute values and therefore, this analysis timeline analysis can be useful from that perspective. Now, how can the mental workload be assessed? Mental workload should be assessed for every task differently. Even the same task carried out under different conditions can be can have different uh, mental workload can lead to different mental workloads. So, various techniques are available uh, concurrent task performance, behavioral measures, subjective measures and neuroergonomic measures and these provide different kinds of information. So, one question is always how to select which one is appropriate that we will look at towards the end. So, first we will go through each one of them in uh, and describe them how they can be used and they are generally used in the in organizations in industry where task performance is of the kind that we have been talking multitasking and other kinds of situations. So, in the concurrent task performance we already talked about concurrent tasks in multitasking for example. So, concurrent task means two tasks are carried out at the 
same time. And there, one task is a primary task, the other task is a secondary task. In the laboratory, generally, the primary task is simple tapping. So the subject is asked to tap a key. And the speed with which the subject can tap the key, that is observed. That is the performance on the primary task. And secondary task, for example, detecting a signal. So when the subject is doing that task manually, press key tapping, simple tapping. Simple tapping can be distinguished from some rule tapping. So one can say, press the key twice or once, right? And so two, one, two, one. So very, with very fast speed, consecutively two, then one then 2, then 1. So this will become 1, 2, 1, 2 kind of. So there can be some more complex rules. So simple tapping would be just involve that. So speed with which the tapping task can be performed is the primary task performance measurement. And secondary task can be a visual signal or an auditory signal. And so this is a secondary task. And the speed, the accuracy with which the signal can be detected. So suppose over session in the laboratory, the task is conduct, tasks are conducted for one hour, then the number of times the signal is missed. Or then the tapping speed, whether it is affected, that can be studied. And that can be an indicator of the uh, mental workload. So primary tasks uh, are these secondary tasks responding to an unexpected probe. This is called probe when, a, when an auditory or a visual signal is presented. Adding numbers, for example. So adding numbers means just two numbers may be shown on the monitor, and the subject's task may be to answer whether the, or respond whether the sum of the two numbers is an even number or an odd number, something like that. And then pressing a key at prefix time intervals. <clears throat> so subject may be asked, as tapping task is going on, the subject may be asked to press a key after every one minute. Right. Now this one minute, the subject uh, will not see from the clock. This may be a biological clock also. Then card sorting at the same time, choice reaction time, classification, say identical versus non-identical shapes, for example. So these are, for example, identical shapes. These are non-identical shapes. So this, so various secondary tasks are possible. And this can provide important information about the uh, mental workload. So the assumption is that when the secondary task intervenes, interrupts, then performance decrement will be there. So decrement in primary task performance, for example, decrease in tapping rate, that will indicate that there is the workload which has increased because of the existence of the secondary task. Deterioration in secondary task performance can also be there. So both the tasks, we have talked about what happens. Either both tasks are, uh, there's a decrement in both or one, et cetera, et cetera. The assumption is the concurrent secondary task should not affect performance on the primary task. Basic idea is that. So because we want the primary task, the, concurrent, the ongoing task not to be affected by the appearance of a secondary task in a, when we want to do an experimental test or we want to measure uh, workload empirically or experimentally. So if that is the assumption, then it's always a good idea to use embedded secondary task, which is, which becomes a component of the total task performance. So we assume that there's a total task performance, for example, driving. And glancing at the rear or side mirror while driving is now embedded task. So it doesn't interfere, you know, it, there's nothing like it will do anything to driving. But the driver will have a glance at the uh, rear window through the mirror. Then there may be subjective measures, which may be unidimensional workload rating scales or multidimensional workload scales. And they can be administered both in the paper and pencil form or in an online form. So various alternatives are possible. Now, unidimensional rating scales are simple, you know. They are simple to administer, simple to interpret, 
just on one particular aspect the measurement is taken and analysis analysis of the data is also simple so what is for example this question can be asked after uh, completion of a task or when the task is going on so what is or was your workload experience so it can be a verbal protocol when the task is going on for example so in different situations the experience of the performer or the operator may be different and therefore the workload ex experience of the operator can also change so obtain a verbal protocol when the task is going on or the task may be over and then a overall summative measure of the uh, workload experience can be obtained so basically uh, then there are two extremes extra attention is available for any additional task or no extra attention is available for any additional task so the subject has now to rate the experience while doing a task or when a task has been completed on these two if the subject felt that yes i could do something extra some more uh, when this task was going on then uh, the subject is in this region and generally we take a line which divides between these two categories depending on the subject's response so subject has to give a response from 1 to 10 and any response that lies within this range is the task demand below the red line so we talked about the red line task in resource demand and resource supply and basically so through this unidimensional rating scale what is being measured is the location of the red line where is the red line and this will be different for different individuals for different tasks and so on so such questions can provide basic information about the measures as based on that representation in terms of resource demand and resource supply so in this region that means the mental workload is either absent minimum low not felt or felt to only a certain level and then in this region the mental workload becomes higher because no extra resource or no reserve resources are available for doing another task so these unidimensional scales are simple and uh, to interpret to understand and to Uh, draw certain conclusions then there are certain multi dimensional workload scales several scales are available and this book uh, by hancock and meshkati is a good book which provides uh, a review of a large number of multi dimensional workload scales but this lecture focuses only one scale as an illustration so we just want to see uh, we want to illustrate how a particular scale is used and from on the basis of which how data can be analyzed and understood so this particular scale was developed at nasa this is called nasa task load index tlx and hart and stevens this is also available in hancock and uh, meshkati's book this scale is useful in assessing differences in workload between qualitatively different tasks that's the wonderful thing about it so even if the tasks are qualitatively different but the basis criteria on which the workload is measured remain the same for example air traffic control versus controlling city traffic during rush hours so now air traffic control is a very different kind of situation whereas controlling traffic by the traffic uh, personnel traffic control personnel on the roads is different the task demands are different and the the situations are different complexities are different but still the same workload scale can be used in those different situations and since this is a multi dimensional scale there are several sub scales idea of a multi dimensional scale is that that is there are some sub scales which can be combined 
a single score can be obtained based on some combination or weighted combination of the performance score on each of those components and uh, that's how this can be used. <coughs> so a single scale is obtained based on that. Now this is to uh, just indicate what are the what the NASA task load index scale uh, looks like. So here um, it measures uh, the it measures six basic parameters. One is mental demand, physical demand, and temporal demand. So mental demand, for example, how mentally demanding was the task? Simple. And physical demand, how physically demanding was the task? Right. If you remember, we made a distinction or we tried to understand how, for example, when systems have developed from physically dominantly used or ph requiring physical involvement to cognitive involvement. So cognitive complexity or involvement has increased over the ages uh, through uh, as required by technology advancement in the history of human development. We will come back to that when we talk about automation in the next session. So mental demand, for example, how mentally demanding was the task? Physical demand, how physically demanding was the task? Simple questions. And temporal demand, how hurried or rushed was the pace of the task? So all these are measured on a 21 uh, point scale. So the subject may put a uh, response here or a response here or a response here. And then so these values are known between uh, 1 to 21. The values can be recorded that way. So we have some score from 1 to 21 on these parameters. And then the other three parameters are performance. How successful were you in accomplishing what you are asked to do? Effort, how hard did you have to work to accomplish the level of performance? And frustration, you know, because if there is a workload, it can lead to frustration. Later on, when we talk about what are the effects of mental workload on performance, then we will see that you know, this, if the stress becomes too high because of the mental workload, then there can be a feeling of frustration because the work does not get done the way one would like it to do or way the operator or the performer has been doing. So how insecure, discouraged, imitated, stressed or uh, annoyed were you while doing this task? Again very low to very high and so, so on these six dimensions one can measure the the workload and also how it is related to performance, effort, frustration, etc. Now, based on this, uh, one can do several things. One can do profiles, for example. So, what can be done is, I can take a, I can take, for example, a space. And here I have those 21 points. And then what I do is I say performance, effort, frustration, and the other three parameters that we looked at in the earlier slide. And then uh, we can plot the score here. So what we can do, plot means we can draw a bar diagram, a you know, whatever that but the let us not draw a bar diagram, let us just indicate by certain some points. So suppose an effort, the value is here, on performance the value is here and for frustration the value is here, etc. Then by having those points we can draw them and we can have a visual profile of how the workload is there and such profiles can be drawn for different individuals. They can be drawn for different tasks and a comparison can be made. So a visual comparison is possible. So it is possible that for task 1, for example, air traffic control, suppose we get 
a visual representation of the profile. So, this is the profile of the profile and then for another task we may have a profile like that. something like that. So, immediate comparisons are possible. So, one can say that for task 1 and task 2 uh, they are uh, comparable on this parameter, but task 1 is more demanding here on this parameter and the uh, task 2 is less demanding as far as effort is concerned. So, you know these comparisons visual comparisons can be made and uh, they can be very useful because the uh, visual presentation of these comparisons can provide in one glimpse the total idea about what is happening. Okay, so, now what? We can get quantitative values also. We can get data on the basis of these 21 points and in addition to that, we can carry out a pairwise comparison which to find out which measure is more relevant to workload. So, what uh, the respondent does is, so what is done is that these uh, six parameters performance, effort, frustration and the other three for example, they are uh, presented in the form of a matrix and uh, so it is six by six matrix performance, effort and frustration for example and other three and then the respondent, the person who has done this, this task and filled up this inventory of this questionnaire, the has to say as to which one is more relevant to workload and the response is given in terms of the comparison, pairwise comparison between the column and the row. So, between performance and performance there will be nothing. So, for example, this will be a blank here because performance we are comparing performance with performance. Performance and effort if performance is more demanding then put a value 1 otherwise put a value 0. So, for example, performance will be more than the frustration for example. So, wherever in a comparison, pairwise comparison, we get these responses. There will be 15 such comparisons, pairwise comparisons because there are 6 dimensions and then we add uh, these values, we add these values. So, we get the frequencies and if we get frequencies are more important for particular dimensions, then we divide that by 15. So, we get what may be called as the relative weights. So, relative weights can be obtained for these parameters based on pairwise comparison and these relative weights are then used to obtain the uh, measures. So, once the relative frequencies or weights this can be told after dividing by 15 we get weights multiply ratings with respective relative weights right and that will give a weighted score for each of these dimensions. So, if the profile is developed with the weighted scores then it will be a uh, much more accurate representation of the measurement of workload. Then there are neuroergonomic techniques, mental workload puts demand on neurons which increase oxygen requirement and therefore, brain supplies more or increase oxygenated blood to those areas where the demand has increased or whichever is the active neural area for different activities, different parts of the brain are involved and therefore, different neurons will be activated. There are different techniques available which are electrophysiological techniques, uh, record the electrical activity of neurons, hemodynamic techniques, assess circulatory status, autonomic techniques, major involuntary physiological processes. So, this is EEG for example, provides a good measure of this in which some electrodes are implanted on the scalp and where from electrical impulses are picked up and these electrodes uh, you know can then generate uh, the, 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 the pick up 
electrical impulses can be recorded uh, visually and therefore, the, and they relate to different areas. So, different electrodes that are implanted, they will pick up electrical impulses from different areas. So, and, and, and these areas can be eye movement and muscular artifacts can influence EEG. So, by looking at that, we can do that. Then there is the ERP, uh, event related potential. That means, if a signal is presented, then what happens to the visual system, the perceptual system, the working memory and all that. And since they are located, they are handled by different parts of the brain, so they will be activated. So, potentials will be generated in those particular sets of neurons. And therefore, it is a, it's considered as a high resolution technique. And there is one particular component in ERP which is called P300. So, most of the research that you will see that people publish is where they indicate uh, the P300 and its waveform in terms of the amplitude and frequency, for example. So, P300 is elicited in decision making, and it's the characteristics of P300 provide important information in several areas of mental work. Uh, so, latency, for example, is a pure measure of perceptual activity. Increase in the difficulty of identifying targets, for example, and not related to increase in the difficulty of response choice. So, that means it is on the information acquisition and processing side. Then amplitude indicates the amount of attentional resources allocated to the target. So, different shapes of the ERP potentials can reveal different information. Then there are some other techniques, positron emission tomography, PET, functional magnetic resonance imaging, fMRI, transcranial Doppler sonography, near infrared spectrography and so on. Then there are some autonomic techniques, heart rate, pulse rate, skin conductivity and pupil size, they can be measured. Now, how does one select which is the appropriate technique? Goron has uh, given a, a good decision making process. So, is safety a major concern? If yes, use simulation best because you cannot put individual to work under hazardous conditions. No, then ask can primary task be manipulated? Yes, use standalone performance measure. No, then ask can non intrusive secondary task be added? If yes, then use secondary task. If no, again ask is our task physical? Yes, use subjective measures. No, use physiological measures. So, you know, this, this uh, decision making uh, fishbone diagram can be used to arrive at a per the choice of a particular technique or appropriate technique to a given situation. Now, so we have talked about the subjective measure, physiological measures. What are standalone performance measures? Standalone measures of performance include ARP workload assessment, control movement per unit time, glance duration and frequency, load stress, observational workload area, rate of gain of information, relative condition efficiency, and speed stress. So, these are uh, uh, you can go through the details if you look at Goron's uh, book, and uh, these details are available. So, just to summarize, multitasking involves doing two tasks, maybe more concurrently or sequentially. Psychological theories of multitasking provide an approach to understand the underlying mechanisms of multitasking. Effort and resource demand, multiplicity, and resource management are three important parameters or characteristics that can be used to understand the resource demand and performance. The effort that is resource allocation to the two tasks depends on the relative difficulty or practice with the task. And performance resource function describes resource trade offs uh, between two time shared tasks. Then, task demand in excess of the available cognitive resources leads to mental workload. Performance on the primary task depends on the resource demand and resource supply. Subjective behavior and neuroergonomic measures, psychophysiological measures can be used for workload assessment. 
selection of an appropriate measure of workload is possible through decision making process. Now, these are some questions for discussion for understanding further. Review the program evaluation review technique. So, there is a technique used by the project management teams used for project management. How will you apply or supply the executive control mechanism to identify ongoing and interrupting tasks there and apply whatever we have understood in this session. Think of some possible ways to reduce the cost of switching between two tasks. Can switch cost be reduced to 0? So, take some example and can you how will you reduce it? Review some literature on the role of remote associations in enhancing creative performance. For example, new software development. Uh, if you remember, we talked about new software development as a uh, as a performance uh, uh, that requires different skill. So, in a multiple task situation, if there is performance enhancement, does it conflict with the concept of switch cost? So, you can see this particular article uh, to as a first review and then add more. Then think of a multiple task situation in which you were recently involved. Use the multiple resource model to represent the task. Self administer the NASA task load index inventory based on your experience with the task and analyze the data. Develop a profile, for example, a bar diagram based on the six component measures to provide a visual representation of the workload. And if you can compare your performance with on two or your experience of workload on two different tasks, that will give a good understanding. What do you suggest in case you experience workload in excess of resource supply? What solution do you have? What would you suggest so that in future if you have to repeat this task, you can have a better situation? These are some references uh, to which you can go for whatever we have discussed in multitasking and mental workload. Thank you very much. Thank you.